Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you also to Tim and Stephen for setting the scene. I won't go into the background and the justification for why we need to do this kind of work, uh, but I think at right out at the outset what I want to do is to acknowledge the people who participated in what is probably by the Department of Health definition the most complex randomized controlled trials they've ever been involved in, and that is evidenced by the significant loss of hair that I've had over the period of the study. It has been, uh, my colleagues also suggested to me that I needed to take a referral to go and see one of my mental health colleagues for even daring to consider to do such a study. But all I can say, as Tim described it, lots of barriers, lots of issues, but the willingness from the sites to deliver the program and the creativity in the sites to overcome barriers has been remarkable. And it actually is a model about how one proceeds in complex trials to get adequate numbers to answer some of these very difficult questions that we face as we go forward in healthcare. So to go back to the overall aim, and I think the word here is a comprehensive evaluation of the addition of telecare and or telehealth to whole system redesign. The idea of the integration of services across health and social care is a critical part of this. But it's the way in which these devices work. Do they work? How do they work? In whom do they work? What's the match between individuals and the devices? And how can we establish using a robust design to provide evidence on the range of these different features? And I'll take you through what we've done and describe some of the elements of the evaluation to you. The plan was to assess up to 6,000 individuals and up to 660 carers. Those numbers are higher than we need and I'll take you through the numbers that we got. We were expecting people to drop out. Of course, people don't sustain necessarily these devices. That's an important question which we can and will address in the study. So the first issue was we were told right at the beginning that we wouldn't be able to do a randomized controlled trial within the environment. And I think the issue about getting robust evidence is really very important. However, I must acknowledge that for the sites in delivering this in the context of a complex delivery mechanism of new technologies requiring people to work in different ways, the establishment of new services, and then they see the evaluation team arrive and say, oh yes, you also have to do this as a randomized controlled trial. That required huge effort and to some extent a culture change within the sites because traditionally clinicians decide on the treatment that their patients receive. They are not asked to randomize some of their patients to receive one thing and other patients to receive another. So the trial design is a cluster randomized controlled trial. And what you have here is you have four groups of general practitioners. And in two groups, they have a social care intervention and their patients eligible for telehealth act as the controls for telehealth. And in the other two groups, the situation is reversed. Standard cluster randomized controlled trial, the, the unit of randomization is the GP practice. And of course, the statistics will take account of that kind of arrangement. Now that is one element of the study, and I'll go through the different elements by the themes. Essentially, we have five themes doing research in the study, and I want to go through each of these in turn. The first one, theme one, which is headed by the Nuffield Trust, is asks the question that many of you are particularly concerned about, does the introduction of telehealth or telecare result in a reduction in service utilization and costs of care? And it goes through the impact on service use as well as associated costs. It uses a model developed by the Nuffield Trust looking at risk stratification. And it really does try and exhaust the data that's available in the public domain by looking at the benefits that will accrue in terms of costs. The minimum number we were aiming for, and this is the key element that we were aiming to get in terms of the numbers in the study, and this is the number of participants, I'm not telling you about the over 400 carers that we have in the study, was 5,721. What I'm now going to take you through is to indicate some of the baseline data and the distributions of individuals who we succeeded in recruiting. So our target was 5,721. 
and we recruited 5,831 participants into the trial. That gives us adequate power to test and examine the statistical issues in relation to costs in the whole sample. And this, as I say, is headed by the Nuffield Trust. The characteristics of these individuals is shown on this slide. And here you can see the numbers in the intervention group and the numbers in the control group. So they're not significantly different uh, in terms of 49% and 51%. The distribution across sites, the sites had different constraints, and as we would expect, they wouldn't necessarily recruit the same numbers. And I think what's important there is we had significant participation from each of the sites, the smallest number being 50, 1,535, and the biggest number being 2,228. And as you look across the sites, you can see the distribution between the control and the intervention. This will enable us to look in some detail at each of the sites, comparing control and intervention on a number of variables to examine the role that the sites played in terms of any differences that we observe. On the next slide, you can see the di division between telecare and telehealth. We recruited 2,600 people into the telecare end of the trial and 3,230 into telehealth. And there you can see the divide on the graph in terms of the control and the intervention. We also, as you know, examined patients with long-term conditions. And the three indexed long-term conditions that we examined were heart failure, COPD, and diabetes. In addition, of course, we recruited people with social care needs. On the next slide, I'll show you the distribution in relation to the long-term conditions. 27% of the patients we recruited had heart failure, 24% had diabetes, and the largest number, nearly 1,600, were ones that had COPD. Again, this data and this, of this number will allow us to do some sub-analysis of each of these conditions and examine them in turn. We did want to go to a number of different sites for a very particular reason, and the sites will be clear about what the different characteristics are. One of the issues is around the relative levels of deprivation. One of our areas, Newham, an inner city area, has a high level of deprivation. One of the characteristics we wanted to look at was an inner city deprived area, a more suburban, somewhat more affluent society, and then a rural society that has more it has pockets of poverty and deprivation. And here you can see, looking at the deprivation index, that the relative levels of deprivation differed by site, and this is, of course, something that we plan to factor in into the analysis. And the highest level of deprivation, you can see there, occurs in Newham. We predict that, and it's an important factor that we will plan to look at. The second theme, and it's the theme which my group is principally involved in, is looking at participant reported outcomes. And one of those would revolve around the carers, carer burden. But in addition, we need to establish how these devices work. The naive belief is you drop in a device and people change their behavior. Well, we do know professionals have to change their behavior. The question is whether the patients and the people in receipt of these devices actually change their behavior. The other issue is we need to understand people's attitudes to these devices. We need to know how they work, and in particular, in whom they work best, in order to establish what surrounding factors we need to intervene on to improve the outcomes in the use of telehealth and telecare. It is an issue not simply about technology, and I think as Tim has said, it's an issue around how these devices are integrated into care, and in particular, the attitudes and the behaviors that they induce in participants. So I think it's a more complex story than just dropping the devices in. And this theme is designed to examine the processes that actually are affected by the introduction of these devices. And that will tell us, in many ways, how to intervene in the future. So we were looking at, and this lists some of the questions, do we have a reduction in informal carer burden when we have a device that's looking at the person being cared for? Does it improve their social isolation and improve psychological well-being? We do know that informal caregivers in the UK 
provide approximately 87 billion pounds worth of free care to look after people. And we also know that they have higher levels of morbidity than indeed the rest of the population. So one of the questions is, do these devices result in benefits to informal carers? And one of the big cost issues is, does that lead in the longer term to a reduction or a, or a uh, delay in people moving into care homes? We will be able to address that question in the study. We want to look at the role of telehealth packages on self-care behaviors and how people think about their capacity to remain independent, their confidence in doing different kinds of behaviors. Do they feel empowered when they get these devices? And there'll be a, a, a systematic review of the impact of these devices on self-care behaviors in heart failure by two of the members of my group. We also need to look around the other impacts of these devices, and in particular, one of the questions that's always asked, do these devices lead to a reduction in the quality of life and psychological well-being of people when they receive it? Or do they feel more remote, less attended to, and so on? And these are questions that we'll certainly be looking at as we go through in the study. Theme three, which is led by my colleagues at the London School of Economics, by Martin Knapp and colleagues, is looking at cost and cost effectiveness as well in a slightly different manner. These two themes use an interview and questionnaire-based assessment of a smaller number of individuals. This is very intensive, and the individuals were assessed at baseline prior to them getting the kit. We did an assessment at three months, and then we did a further and final assessment at 12 months to examine the longer-term impact of these devices. One of the reasons why we wanted to look at an early-stage assessment is there's this phenomenon of people being excited by the technology and using it, as we all know when we get our new mobile phones. We like to play with them initially and use them probably more than we should. Now, some people do become addicted to them, but others less so. But there is this phenomenon of early use of technology and one of our concerns in reviewing the literature is that there are lots of studies with very short-term outcomes showing positive benefits. And then the question is, are they sustained in the longer term? Short-term benefits are all well, well and good, but in whom are they sustained? And one really needs to understand the processes and the identity and characteristics of those individuals who stick with the devices. So, for example, if we can identify that the, num the length of time, as the question asked earlier, people stick with the devices, it's those people who derive the most benefit, and we can identify the characteristics and the attitudes of people who do stick with it, and indeed those who don't, we might introduce an intervention looking at the attitudes of people and trying to intervene right at the beginning, at the outset of any study. The other issue is, if we have benefits at three months and then ta people tailor off in their use of the devices but they retain the benefits, this suggests a totally different model around how we distribute these kit and equipment. We could, for example, introduce it for a short time until people's behavior and their condition has improved to a certain level and then say, well, we'll take it away and redistribute it. And then if your behavior changes when we monitor it next, we might reintroduce it. These are really important questions that we'll be addressing going forward. So this, these two themes use quantitative data based on interview and questionnaire assessment. These are the sorts of questionnaires that we've used in the study. We've looked clearly at psychological well-being, both looking at anxiety and depression. The assumption underlying this is that people will feel that there's reassurance delivered to them if they feel they are continually being monitored. And we do know that people with long-term chronic conditions have higher levels of depressed mood. And it's important to see whether this has an impact. Quality of life we measured in two different ways. We measured it generically in order for us to make comparisons uh, in terms of other studies and broad-based normative data that's available. And then for each of the chronic conditions we selected targeted disease-specific quality of life measures. We also looked at disability 
and in terms of the sorts of activities that people engage in, in particular for the social care group. We're particularly interested in that intersect between self-care, self-management, and the use of devices. I think the question really is, is that these two in types of interventions in the world of long-term conditions actually need to be brought together. And they need to be brought together in a coherent and integrated way. And one of the things that we need to look at going forward is not simply the technology, but how you integrate it in terms of self-care behaviors. Self-management and self-care have as outcomes exactly the same thing that I think technology, the introduction of these assistive technologies has. And the key question then is, how do you bring these two together? So we looked at self-care behaviors in relation to the particular conditions, but we also wanted to look across the whole sample to look at generic self-care behaviors. And then we used a measure that's looking at the impact and the quality of these kinds of programs in terms of self-care and self-management. How you act depends on how you think. If you think that you have the capacity and the power to remain awake during this presentation, you're more likely to do it than if you don't think you have that capacity. If you think you have the capacity to deal with your disability and to re-engage in the social world, that can influence how well you behave. So intercepting between a disease and its outcome and consequences for the individual are these thoughts around what people do. If we understand how people think about these devices, and indeed how they think about themselves, that will give us a clue as to how we might wish to intervene and might act as a predictor in terms of those people who stick with the devices and indeed derive benefit. So we have a whole series of cognitive measures where we look carefully at how people think about these devices and we th how they think rather about themselves in the first instance. Then does that change when you introduce the device? And then what's the influence of the utilization of these devices in terms of outcome? We also felt it was very important, in particular in the intervention group, to get an understanding of people's acceptance and acceptability of having these devices in their homes. And there's a very interesting study, which I'll describe very briefly to you, around people's suspicion of devices, concern that they're being observed, whether they think these devices will help them, whether they find them intrusive. So issues around confidentiality, anxiety about whether they can use the kit are all elements that we've assessed in this part of the study. We looked at the measure of strain of having a chronic condition and we have indexed chronic conditions but we also have comorbid conditions to see whether there's a cumulative effect and the impact of illness. And then of course we need to have an understanding about how people perceive themselves in relation to their own social world and how others would perform these kinds of behaviors. And then a range of other additional me measures that we looked at. The first three of these are specifically looking around <coughs> issues to do with cost effectiveness and are used by my colleagues from LSE in theme three. We want to look at the sorts of social networks that people establish. Do, does the introduction of these devices allow people to create different social contacts co and indeed reduce social isolation? That applies both to the people who are in their homes, as this is a study on home-based care, not one about mobile care, but does it enable them to have the confidence to engage in creating social networks? In particular, this would apply to carers. Informal carers are socially isolated. Having these devices potentially and the security that the cared for person is being monitored <coughs> could give them the security to re-establish their social networks. So carer confidence and anxiety and the strain and burden of the carers we would think is one of the areas where telecare devices might have a major impact. So in these themes, themes two and three, questionnaire-based and interview-based studies, you can see there that we recruited over 2,700 participants, distributed again across the sites. These are overlapping numbers with the first approximately 6,000. So they're the same group of people, um, but we did intensive studies in this number in order for us to be able to examine these devices on those kinds of measures 
in terms of outcomes, psychological well-being, quality of life, and the processes that I've just described to you. And if you have a look at the distribution of telehealth and telecare, in telehealth we recruited uh, 845 to the intervention group and 728, and then you can see a slightly smaller number reflecting the distribution in relation to telehealth and telecare in the larger trial. And that's the distribution in relation to the conditions, heart failure, 540, COPD, 578, and diabetes, 455. This will enable us to look at each of these conditions along the variables and the measures I've just described to look at processes and indeed outcomes from the patient reported outcome measures that we've used. I want to talk now about two of the other themes. Theme four has been led by the University of Manchester and the University of Oxford, and this involves qualitative studies. Qualitative studies are an important adjunct to quantitative studies. They provide you with different types of information, and they provide you with information that's reflective on how people consider these issues, and indeed that is a complement to the quantitative studies that we've been doing. So it's really looking at the experiences of people who have been offered these devices, the carers, and also the professionals. There's a very big issue around health and social care professionals' attitudes and acceptance of these devices as one of the barriers to their introduction. Because the introduction of these devices involves human capital change. And I think not to pay attention to what our expectations are in terms of training and understanding and the capacity to integrate these devices in the kinds of care that is offered is really critical. And the questions that are asked there are ones in which there's an intensive interview and assessment using a really rigorous method. And you will hear an important presentation by Caroline Sanders that's presenting later in this conference because one of the groups we became particularly interested in are those people who say, well, you've told me all about these devices, but I don't want them. And we needed to know why. And Caroline's study with her colleagues in Manchester is an absolutely critical level of understanding about why people refused. And indeed, people refused at different points. It's not that there's a huge volume of them, but if you're thinking about rollout and the characteristics and identity of these people, it really is very important. But what is interesting is pe some people refused when they had the devices installed. They said, please take them out. Now, knowing why they said that is really important in terms of how we understand the rollout of these devices. In addition, there were interviews done with a similar rigor by our colleagues from Oxford who looked very carefully at the responses of those people delivering the devices and managing the process. And understanding their attitudes and devices will tell us, uh, their attitudes to these devices, will inform us about the sorts of work that we need to do within sites, within professionals, if we are actually going to have the capacity to mainstream these in a way that will be effective. Theme 5 is led by our colleagues from Imperial College, and they were looking at organizational issues. And they really are interested in examining <coughs> organizations and the way organizations can facilitate or impede the adoption and indeed the sustainable adoption and integration of these devices. They've done studies in two sorts of ways. They have studied, <coughs> excuse me, the three sites that are involved in the WSD trial. But in addition, they've studied other sites that are not in the trial, because the trial obviously introduces some complexities. And being able to study the organizational issues in other environments will tell us more about the organizational questions and the organizational changes that need to be introduced in terms of introducing these devices overall in health and social care. I think what's important is we know we can't stand still. Doing nothing is generally not an option. We've looked at a number of interventions to deal with an aging population, the growth of chronic disease, and indeed the requirements on care homes or other facilities to support people in their older age. We do need to be very clear and careful to use any investment that we make appropriately and targeted. 
And I think that we'll have data from the study to advise you how to do that. I just wanted to acknowledge all the participants from the different areas who've been working with us. This has been an extremely complex study. It's required an enormous amount of tolerance and uh, sharing of concerns and solving of problems as you went through. And what is important about this is that I think we've had a great success across the uh, supposed rigor of academia meeting the delivery of health care. And I just want to acknowledge Chris Ham's role. Chris has served as a superb intermediary between the determination of the evaluation team matching the determination of the sites and how to reconcile differences. Thank you very much for listening.